distinguished lecturers. Um, today, we are very pleased to be joined by uh, Susan Coppersmith, who is a professor of physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And she is a researcher who looks at, amongst other things, quantum computing. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. Uh, and it's going to be a very interesting discussion. Anyone who's watching can submit questions using the chat function. Uh, or if you have follow-up questions after the session, or if you're watching this recorded, you can submit questions via social media or through Sigma Xi's communities page. We'll get those to Dr. Coppersmith to answer. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Oh, sure. Coppersmith. Thank you for having me. Great. Um, so this is a really exciting field, and it's one that's developing quickly uh, with a lot of drive behind it. I think uh, a lot of computer researchers, especially in hardware, are starting to feel the pinch of uh, size reduction in computing. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in hearing your take on how this is all working out. But uh, I would like to start, if you wouldn't mind, just as sort of a setup mm -hmm. for people. I think a lot of people know the term quantum mechanics and they sort of have a sense of what that means but I think a lot of people don't really understand the quantum part of quantum mechanics I wondered if we could define that for them why is it called quantum um, mechanics well it's interesting because it's called quantum mechanics because a quantum is actually a, a jump all right so if you have um, an atom and you and what happens is that you can say well what's the light that comes out of an atom if you excite it. This is how, for instance, fluorescent light works, is uh, that you excite things and then they, they let off light. And it turns out that in quantum mechanics, the light has a very well-defined color. All right, it's the, it, that's the wavelength of the light, but it turns out the color and the wavelength are, you know, the one tells you the other. And and before it used right. to be oh okay you could get any wavelength you wanted you put you, if you drive it harder you could get a you know it, it would go faster and your wavelength would go down, but it turns out that again there are these things that were called the quantum jumps. Now, um, and that's how quantum mechanics got its name is because of the quantum jumps. Um, for quantum computing though, it's named more after quantum mechanics than the quantum jumps. And there, I would say the key thing is that if you have a lot of different quantum mechanical objects and they can all talk to each other, it turns out that there, there are extra what are non-local correlations, which are also called quantum correlations. And it turns out those can be used in, in information processing situation to make more, to, to be able to solve certain problems faster than in any classical system. And so that's the origin of quantum computing is to use the quantum mechanics that you get when you're thinking about atoms and individual electrons and little spins and actually be able to do computations that would take you much longer in a regular computer, in a you know computer like your phone. Your phone is a pretty powerful computer, actually, but but it only works with ones and zeros, right. and it doesn't work with quantum mechanical objects. Right. So you mentioned spins there, and I think yeah. that might be uh, something that's kind of key to what we're talking about in this discussion. So maybe we should fill Great. in there a little bit. So electrons have sort of a spin state. Um, and part of the sort of discretized or quantized nature here is that they only have specific right. spin states. Is that right? There's not like a whole range of them. It can either right. be one thing but, or the other. And here, I'll, I'll do my thumb. So again, this is the thing about yeah. the quantum <laughs> is that what happens is if, you know, if, you, if I think about my thumb and it's just a spin going around just like a top, and I could imagine tilting my thumb and I can, I can have it go any angle. So if I think about like what component is vertical, I'd say, oh, it could all be vertical or it could be quarter or half. And in quantum mechanics, it turns out that either it's up or it's down when you measure it. And then you can have different mixtures of up and down. So you could say, oh, well, half the time it's up and half the time it's down, or three quarters of the time it's up and three quarter, or in one quarter of the time it's down. But it's always when you measure it, either one or the other. And so that is really critical for um, 
when we're when we're making the what are called the qubits in the quantum computer as opposed to the bits in the classical computer. So so right. that's that was great because right. that was a good way of this getting to the qubits, which were the key thing that we need to make. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because the a bit is basically yeah. a the basic unit of storage right. in a computer, right? And so a qubit is, is the unit of storage exactly. in a quantum computer. Um, but one of the things you've mentioned there that we might want to kind of spell out a little bit more is about measurement and how um, you were saying when you measure it, it's yeah. in one state or the other. So there's actually sort of this relationship where measurement in quantum mechanics actually kind of puts things in a state or, or kind of takes things out of a, a every state and into a right. specific state. So measurement. Yeah. Really key and here. so that's that that's. Again, I, quantum mechanics is really strange, <laughs> and again, we're trying to take advantage of it. Of course, but yeah. that's a, a really critical thing: is that um, if I if I just take the spin and I can prepare it, it can be in a situation where um, you, it, it's in it's it's in what's called a superposition of up and down, and um, it's. And, and 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 there there's good reason to believe there's like. This is like a long story, but nonetheless, there's good reason to believe that it's it it's in a superposition of up and down, and it's not like oh, it knows which one it, it it's in, but you just don't know. It's not it's not like you flip a it, you flip a coin and you don't know whether it's going to be heads or tails. But but in principle, you'd say oh, okay, if I could just really you know f take a picture of the coin and look at it really carefully and figure out what it was going to do, I would know. In principle, you can't know in quantum mechanics, and that's a really fundamental difference. But then, when you measure it, of course, then you know, and um, right. and so so that means that something had to have changed, and so that's that's something which is really important when you're trying to make these things and get them to work to realize that you know the fundamental properties of measurement. Right, okay. Now, um, one of the other pieces here um, that I think is kind of key is um, I, th I think in one of the things you've mentioned in, in your talks and things like that is that when you have multiple measurements, yeah. the the state of the spin stays the same over multiple measurements? Once you've, Once measured, you've measured it, it you've changed it, and work? then it's then you, it's set. You know what I mean? It, you know, and again, you could make it do something else, but if you just left it there, once you've measured it, you've changed it, but then after that, it's in the new state and then goes on from there. So, um, right, okay. yeah, so it's this thing that there's this sort of special quantum state, which is, again, the technical term is called superposition. It's in the superposition, but then when you measure it, you destroy the superposition, and then you're in, you know, and then and then after that, you never get, you know, you don't get it back unless you prepare it again. You're just in the state after the measurement. That's interesting. And uh, um, and and by the way, this was uh, this 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 phil it it sounds like a philosophical point, and it sort of is a philosophical point. Um, but this is why Einstein really, really, really didn't like quantum mechanics. He was a, an inventor of quantum mechanics, but then when, when the whole thing sort of got codified, he, this this property of measurement really, really bothered him. And so that was why he's really not yeah. able to accept quantum mechanics as a correct theory of physics. Yeah. Right, yeah. I, but it's I think that idea of measuring something and putting it in a state and having it be stable yeah. in that state, that's pretty key for storing information, right? I mean, if you you got to have a stable state to oh, I store see what information, you're saying. Yeah, is that um, correct? That is true. You need a yeah. stable state, but actually we want to keep the superposition. So that's actually one of the keys and why there's a thing called a quantum memory, because mm -hmm. Basically, like mm -hmm. once you measure it, if you think about the spins as being either up or down, like after you measure it, it has to pick one of those. Mm -hmm. But actually, you want to actually encode this much more complicated information of the superposition of everything. And there's a lot, okay. there's a lot of it. I see. And so, um, but then when you when you want it to come out, like we somehow only look at the classical world. Like our, our intuition is all classical. And then you, if you do, you know, you sort of figure, oh, I've got to, you know. I'll get a result, and to only get one result, that's like a classical statement. And so, you know, so so it's sort of the measurement process is when you translate to us, to the classical world. I see. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
in terms of relating this to quantum computing, let's just back up for a second um, and talk about how quantum mechanics comes yeah. into computers. So we were sort of mentioning about transistors and how yeah. they store this bit, which is a zero or a one kind of digitally. Um, but what we want to talk about here is the limit of classical computing. So maybe we could just explain um, how, this this standard in computing has been that transistors have been getting smaller and yeah. smaller and smaller, um, so you can pack more into an available space. Is that what has allowed computers to get faster? Is just the density of transistors in an available space? Is that why they've gotten yes. more powerful? Yes. So that's that, that. I mean, that's just one of the um, technological threads that's really pushing this. Is that basically right. just the size of each transistor? has gotten smaller and smaller over the last 50 years. And now we're actually getting down to the point where uh, sort of the current um, iPhone technology is, I think, 14 nanometers. I think this is um, in, in the iPhone 7S. It's 14 nanometers. And a nanometer For is a, um, uh, a billionth of a meter. But the thing is that it's made out of silicon, and the separation between the atoms and the silicon is only about an is only about one nanometer. So you're actually getting down to where the transistors themselves are, you know, only a few atoms, and uh, and 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 that has been why it sort of believe that this just making things smaller has to fail because you can't make a transistor that's smaller than one atom out of silicon anyway. I mean, you have to do something else. So quantum computing is a way of sort of increasing the power of computation on a different axis. Instead of doing the, just the sheer shrinking axis, you're doing, you're changing the way the transistor works. And it turned out this was sort of necessary to do anyway because, again, as the transistors shrink, they, it's easier for them to act quantum mechanically because sort of big things that quantum effects are, we don't notice them at all. But as things get smaller and smaller, the, the quantum effects become more and more noticeable and they affect the properties of the transistors a lot. So, so the, everything went together in the sense of, oh, well, let's see if we can use the quantum mechanics to make the computer more powerful. Because we will not be able to shrink it. Uh, the, the, if you just extrapolate, it's 2035 is the year, I think, when um, the size of a transistor would be one atom if the current trend were to continue. And so after that, you know, you can't do it anymore. Right. And and so basically, what happens is as the transistors shrink down in size, you're saying the uh, other effects, the quantum effects, right. become more noticeable. Is that just because the uh, the other physical effects, uh, you know, uh, things like gravity and whatever, um, don't have as much ef effect oh, on I that scale? Uh, it's just well, not I think the way to think yeah. about it is that okay, so the way a regular transistor works. More or less. I mean, I'm not going to get into all the details. But what happens right, is sure. that basically it has um, it has a bunch of charges, and, and you know it has like a one or a zero, and there's like a charge that has moved. Okay, but it's not one electron that moves. It's a bunch of electrons that move. And you know if if one you know and so if you didn't know where one of them was, it, it's like okay because there you know it might be like a hundred, right? And, you know if one of them's misplaced, it's still okay. But as you shrink things down, then what happens is just the number of electrons you're moving around goes down, and then all of a sudden you're faced with like one electron. Is it here or there? And if you don't know where it is, it's like a big mistake. And so things become more uncertain just because the number of electrons that you're working with is going down. Okay. And so then, like, right. you can think of quantum mechanics, some aspects of it is just not knowing what it, you know, the electrons are, are uncertain. Like, they're, you know, you can think of, oh, they're fuzzy, all right? We don't know exactly where they are. Um, uh, and again, if you have, like, a lot of fuzzy things, but they're all sort of in more or less the right thing, then, you know, you can be pretty certain what state you're in. But as the number of electrons goes down, that fuzziness becomes more and more of a problem. And so that's why even if you just wanted to do it classically, the, at some point scaling it down, you have to think about the uncertainties that come from the fact that it's quantum mechanical. So, yeah, so people right, were sort okay. of stuck thinking about this anyway. And then, um, and then in the mid-90s, um, well, actually it was sort of, um, uh, people had sort of talked at a very sort of abstract level of, oh, maybe we could use quantum mechanics. 
um, to make more, more powerful computers. So um, Feynman wrote a very famous paper about this in the, around 19, um, I think it was around 1980. But but in the mid 90s, it actually became quite. That was the plenty of. Yeah, robotics. right. It was it was right. This thing of like, oh, there's a lot to do. But he actually had this like, oh, we can right, we can make things smaller, and then they'll be quantum mechanical, and then there can be all this power from the smallness. Um, but then in the mid 90s, it became quite specific, where there were there were certain there were certain um, problems that were of great commercial interest. That um, you uh, that 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 Peter Shor showed you could solve more efficiently using the laws of quantum mechanics, and that's really what got people's attention to the point of trying to say, well, how do you make one of these things? Um, you know, because again, it was like, oh yeah, this sounds sort of cool, but there wasn't a big push to do it experimentally until there was like, um, basically, what what his what his algorithm does. Um, it, it, it's a very sort of, you would never know it from the name of the algorithm, but what it does is it enables you to break um, uh, all the most widely used um, uh, cryptography codes, uh, what are called public key cryptography yeah. codes. And so all of a sudden it was like, oh, we can break into the banks and steal a trillion dollars. I mean, and that's not quite true, but, but it was clear that, you know, there are other applications too. And, uh, um, uh, and, you know, and so that's, that's like, oh, well, can you really do this? Is this really possible? And that really got people's attention. So, um, yeah. Right, um, sure. Yeah, but, but it was totally unexpected at the time. It was, it, it, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum, quantum computing went from, you know, really, you know, considered totally far out to, oh, this would be really neat if we could build one of these things. So, um, you know, pretty quickly <laughs> for that reason, because all of a sudden there were, there right. were algorithms that solve problems that would be, you know, very interesting if you could solve them. So. Right, right. Um, I will just remind people listening that if you have questions, please uh, type them in the chat window, and uh, that way we'll be able to see them and answer them. Um, or if you have questions later, you can follow up either on social media or in the Sigma Xi communities page. Um, I will also just mention that if you are interested in learning more about how traditional transistors work, there's an article on the American Scientist website called The Long-Lived Transistor, Transistor that explains wow. how transistors actually yes. function as gates. So that's good background for anybody interested. Um, but you were sort of talking about this before, but maybe we uh -huh. get more into it. I mean, there is there a fundamental why well there is a fundamental difference you're saying in computing speed yeah. for quantum computers and you're talking about how the superposition state yeah. kind of allows that but can you detail that a little bit more about why that changes oh, your computing okay. speed so the thing and and now again this was Feynman Feynman is really the person who first put things in this term but basically what happens is you have a bunch of bits we'll start with any and again just think about your phone okay cuz you know, just sort of how your phone is doing everything, and and again, it just take it's just a whole lot of bits um, that are all talking to each other. But if you want to say, well, what's the state of your phone? And then you can you can say, all right, well, this bit's one and this bit's zero, and 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 again, they're just a bunch of a bunch of transistors, and they and they they each have different you know charges on them, and you know, and then you just look at the charge in each one, and you can figure out the state of the whole thing by just like saying the first one's in the state, the second one's in the state, the third one's in the state, and you can just go through all, it's about 200 million of them, all 200 million transistors, you can figure out what they are, and to do that you need 200 million numbers, one for each one. Um, but when you have a quantum state, it turns out that it's not just that, you know, each one is one or zero, but there's, there, there, there's, um, you know, there, it's like some probability of being in one and some probability of being in zero. And it's not just probability, it's like an amplitude because things can interfere. And that's really hard to describe in a web chat. Okay. But what happens is it's, right, yeah. it's like everybody's talking to everybody else. And to actually describe the states, you need exponentially many numbers. So it's like two to the 200 million, which is just, you know, just unbelievably large. I mean, even if you had like only like a couple of hundred, two to the couple of hundred is like 10, is like billions and billions and billions. It's, you know, more than the age of the universe, whatever. And it's the scaling that's so different because in, in a, for the classical case where you just have the bits, 
it's linear. Like each qubit, you need one more number. And here, every time you add a qubit, you double the number of numbers you need to describe a state. And so that's what Feynman was talking about. He's like, there's just so much information in there. It's hard to get out because we have to measure in order to get it out. And whenever you measure, you, you, you screw up the state. But in principle, that information's in there. And that was what the big you know, advance was to figure out how, in certain cases, you could use that incredible energy density during the calculation to get the answer you want out at the end, OK? And, uh, um, and, and again, we, there are only a few problems that we know we can do this with. It just happens one of them is commercially extremely important. Um, and, and, but, but people yeah. feel that, like, you know, if we knew more, we would be able to figure out other problems that could be solved using uh -huh. using these resources it's just that they're so unintuitive it's hard to come up with algorithms that you know for problems that people want to solve right so when you're talking about security issues and, and yeah. cryptography and things like that you're talking about NP complete problems. Uh, no right? actually not so it turns out that um, NP okay. complete problems uh, oh, okay I'll explain what they are so um, uh, first, I'll explain what NP is. All right, so 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 P right. is, is simple. P is a problem you can solve in polynomial time, and um, so for instance, if you multiply things together, you you know you you do the things, you carry, you add, you do whatever, and uh, and the thing is that if you count like the number of digits, you have to do something for every. Uh, you know, for the ones and the tens and the hundreds and the thousands, you do, but you do something for each right. digit, okay? And it turns out that right. the the number of operations you need to do to multiply those number scales is a polynomial of the number of digits. I actually, forget. I think it's the cube, but I'm not sure. Because you know, again, you have to add and you have to carry more. It's not it's not proportional to the number of digits, but it's the number of digits cubed. Okay, so so a problem like that is 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 said to take polynomial time because the number of digits is 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 called the size you know is, is in general you say that's the size of the problem, and then it, the the amount of time it takes to solve scales like um, a polynomial of the size, and so um, NP is um, uh, a problem which is and what what NP stands for is called non-deterministic polynomial and what that means is that if someone were to give you the answer then you could check it in polynomial time okay but doesn't it and you might be able to solve it in polynomial time and you might not be able to solve it in polynomial time and the general question of whether it takes polynomial time is uh, called the P versus NP question. Okay, so so people, I mean, they've done these surveys of you know computer scientists, and they say, oh, do you think P equals NP? Does that mean? And that means if you can check it in polynomial time, can you solve it in polynomial time? Mm -hmm. And usually, most of most of them say, well, no, I think there are problems that you know until you give me the answer, I can't solve it. Okay, um, in polynomial time. Okay, so so the problem that was uh, that Peter Shore was solving was factoring. Okay, and that is like I, you take the two numbers. You, I, um, uh, there, you know, there's the multiplication I was talking about. I, I give you two numbers and then you multiply. Um, but what he was doing is that someone gives you a you know really big number and you have to find the factors. And it turns out that that's a problem that classically. Um, no one knows how to solve in polynomial time. Obviously, you can check it. If I give you the factors, you multiply them together. And so the thing is in NP, you can check it in polynomial time. Um, uh, but, it, but that problem is not considered to be NP complete. So what NP complete is, is that if I could solve that problem, I could solve any problem in NP. And, right. and that's more general, but, but factoring is like not so, not as general as that, but still, no one has come up with a polynomial algorithm for it. And so in general, the problems that people think are more amenable to quantum computers are that kind of problem, not NP-complete, but, but in, P, yeah, in NP, but not necessarily solvable in, in polynomial time. OK, so yeah. Right, so the, the point here, though, is that a lot of the methods that are used for cryptography now are sort of work because 
they're, they take a long time yes. to solve. So that's part of what makes yeah. them difficult problems is the time yes. it takes to solve. Yeah, them. and sorry to be pedantic, but that's exactly right. right. No, no, no. And, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so that's the thing is that, you know, if I, if, if, you know, and they just keep adding digits. So as, as classical computers get more powerful, they keep adding digits to make sure that nobody can factor the numbers. But again, it's still, it's only a couple hundred digits. And, and you know, in, in given, you even if you had a server farm and you gave the number to Google and Google would use all of its stuff, a few hundred, a few hundred digits is enough that they can't, they can't factor it in a day. I mean, that's sort of, you know, you'd say, okay, well, you know, or or a month or whatever, um, but but again, if you right. have polynomial time, then then you would need you know just enormous numbers of digits, and so actually okay. there there is okay. a task force that you know is is trying to figure out what to do with 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 you know what algorithms to use once a quantum computer becomes available, because I mean I don't know I was talking to some guy from Citibank. And he's just like, you know, well, they do have this worry that if someone were to build a quantum computer, a really large scale quantum computer, then, you know, someone could just steal all of Citibank's money. And, <laughs> and, and you know, and so, so people are worried about this. But, but again, we're, we're not close to achieving that. But if we did, then I would, you know, well, if I did it, then I'm not sure. I, I would be very honest and I'm sure I would not steal anybody's money. But, but, but you know. This is something that, you know, again, because the cryptographic systems currently used are all susceptible to quantum attack. But, but, but it turns out there are things that are not believed to be susceptible to quantum attack, but they're all terrible in some way. And so there's, you know, people don't want to shift until they have to because the, the codes are not nearly as nice and everything's much less efficient. And, um, um, and so, you know, that's, that is something that people are worrying about. In, including, you know, and again, right. I talked to a guy from Citibank who worries about this, so it's sort of, uh, of course, yeah. yeah. So um, what I'd like to talk okay. to you about is um, how one actually goes about building a qubit. I mean, uh -huh. sort of the physical manifestation of it. Um, and I know you have one approach yeah. to it, but there's there's several. There's not just one way to yeah. build a, a qubit, basically. So I wondered if you could kind of okay. talk about the different ways that people are trying to okay. build qubits that are just sort of physically, because okay. you have to physically right. build them. Somehow. I'm going to do that, but I noticed somebody chatted. Sure. So this is so exciting. Yeah, Thank she you for did. chatting. So, um, uh, uh, so let me ask that. So the question was, uh, does everyone see the questions, or do, should I repeat the questions? I think so. Okay. I, I can repeat the question if you like, but yeah. um, she, you kind of answered it, but I guess more specificity would be good, um, just talking a bit more about post-quantum yeah. cryptography. Okay. And so, so again, um, this, this is a field which I find very interesting. It's not what I'm working on, but I, I think it's really cool. So that's why I went on a bit about it. So again, what's called post-quantum cryptography is it's, um, the goal is pretty simple. That, that, that sort of, it turned out that the, um, the, the cryptographic algorithms that, that people use for, you know, all of internet commerce and every, your cash machine and, you know, every time you swipe a credit card, I mean, all those things, uh, turns out it's, it, there's the algorithm is called, um, the RSA algorithm. It's named after, the guys who invented it, but um, I forget, Rivest, Shamir, and Adelson, I think. Um, uh, that algorithm is susceptible to quantum attack. Okay, so that's the algorithm that Shor's algorithm can attack and, and, you know, and break, break, you know. Okay, so, so that is, you know, sort of, that's sort of current, the current algorithm, but it has many, many wonderful qualities to it. Okay, and, um, and so, um, but one thing which is known, uh, w or which is not known, I guess I want to say, is whether it's true that, you know, factoring takes, you know, not, it can't be done in polynomial time. And again, this is the statement that the P versus NP question is not solved, right? And, um, and so we don't know for absolute sure that you can't break um, the RSA algorithm without a quantum computer. But nobody's figured out how, and lots of people have tried, and so we just say, oh, okay, well, okay, classically, we can't solve it. So when we talk about post-quantum algorithms, what we're talking about is um, algorithms that there's no known quantum attack. So it's sort of the same, right? You know, it's like, well, there might be a quantum attack, but we just haven't thought of it yet. 
just like there might be a classical way of, of factoring a big number, but we, we, you know, but nobody's thought of it yet. And, and so that's one of the things that's really sort of a problem for post-quantum cryptography is that what people do is they, they come up with things that, you know, Shor's algorithm or, or, you know, sort of the well-known quantum algorithms that, 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 you know, uh, you use to break RSA, you know, the, the, the code is such that you can't use those attacks. And, um, and, and so let me give you an example of, of, of a thing that, um, uh, the, for instance, of like the kind of thing that people do. Um, so, so it turns out that um, Shor's algorithm is, is is this very beautiful thing, and it's it's like truly amazing. Um, but the sort of heart of the thing, it has many steps, and then it boils down to the key quantum thing. Okay, and basically, what it is is that you 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 have some function. Okay, it's like ones and zeros, but still, you have some input and output, and you know, and you see if it has a period. Okay, as you as you ratchet up through all your possible inputs. And what it does is it provides an efficient way for finding the period of a periodic function when you don't know it. Okay, and um, and, and again, classically. So, yeah. so just yeah, just 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 to mention to people what you're talking about here is a period. It's it's sort of a pattern that's yeah, like a it's a pattern, pattern that repeats. repeats. Like, does that does you know does the output repeat as a function as you as you scroll through your input? Does it does is there a pattern right. that repeats? And it, it, it does this extremely efficiently, much more efficiently than you can do classically. Because essentially the problem is classically you have to look at all, you know, you have to look at all the inputs to know what all the outputs are and to know if it's a period, right? But quantum mechanically, because of the, you know, the fact that everything is correlated uh, non-trivially, you can, you can actually like not look separately. You can look at superpositions of different things and then you don't have to look at as many right. of the inputs. I mean, you're looking at all of them, but you only do it in one step at a time. Like you can do it in, in many right. fewer steps. Okay, so so one of the things that they know is that they say, well, this this is a this is an example of a case where you where you say, oh, I've got a group. The group is the integers. You know, I'm one. To, you know, and I keep, can keep adding one to each number, and you get another number. And then you look at a subgroup, and, and the subgroup is like, oh, when I go by ten, I'm back to where I started. So I can go, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine zero and then start again and that so a, a smaller group can reproduce the whole thing because it's periodic and so one thing that people did is they tried to generalize this for groups that were what's called non-abelian so like for instance like rotations in space you can you can you, you know once you say it's a subgroup you can say oh I have the whole space or I can just look at partially things and um, you know rotate by 90 degrees in different directions and it turns out that you can't there's no straightforward way of generalizing Shor's algorithm to that kind of situation. Okay, and if you do then say, oh, okay, can you turn that into a cryptographic system? You know, that's the kind of thing that people do. They come up with things that you know Shor's won't work for, or or all any of them. Okay, and and you know, but it turns out they tend to be pretty complicated. And then it turns out the key, which is sort of the thing that tells you, you know, which random number you're using when you're doing your Right. The keys tend to be very long, which means they're more expensive to run, et cetera, et cetera, and, um, and, and they're just a lot more complicated. And so, but then in the end, you don't know for sure <laughs> that they're immune to quantum attack. Of course, the problem is you don't know that they're immune to classical attack either, because again, this is like one of these great open problems in computer science. So anyway, I find it's very interesting, and again, and people are sort of hesitant to shift from one thing that you don't know for sure is going to work to another sure. thing that you're not sure is going to work. You know, the hope is that there'll be an advance in the meantime, and so, so but people want right. to be able to change before they lose a trillion dollars. So that it's sure. it's really, a, I mean, that that yeah. part of it's really you know interesting. So I hope that um, I hope that helped. Uh, in terms of uh, yeah. some sense of like, you know, this sort of big picture of like why people care and um, also why it's such a hard problem because again, you know, sort of the power of what you could do is not really understood very well and so something mm -hmm. for people yeah. to do in the future. Okay, so so now, now let me go back and uh, I'll talk to you about the question you actually asked because it is what yeah. I've been working on. And, and that is like once you've decided that it's interesting to make a quantum computer, um, well, how do you do it? All right. 
And um, it turns out that um, there, there are several different ways that people have proposed to make quantum computers. Um, and uh, the progress has been really pretty amazing. Um, uh, and so people may have heard that, um, like, so Google, so IBM has a five qubit quantum computer that they have online, and Google has a quantum computer. They claim they're going to have 20 qubits. Some online, I don't know, actually, I don't know if they're going to put it online, but they're going to have a 20 qubit quantum computer working this year, is the, you know, mm -hmm. claim. And, uh, and, and, and let me, let me again be pedantic, sorry, it's what, it's what academics do. Um, there, there's also, um, there's a company called D-Wave, and they make uh, things that they call quantum computers, but they're a little different. They're, they're, they're what um, most people call quantum annealers. So they're sort of described by the interactions between the, the spin, they have spins, so they have, and, and they interact, and, and sort of the energy is sort of described by a quantum mechanical energy, but they have enough dissipation in them that, that the dynamics are um, uh, not really quantum mechanical with dynamics. I see. And so you know, and so so they, they have a lot of interesting properties, but but you can't run. Shor I mean, if you had one that was like a million qubits, you would not be able to run Shor's algorithm on it. Okay. Whereas the ones that IBM is making and um, uh, Google is making, and and then uh, um, the, you know there are other groups working on on, on things too. I, I won't go go through every group. Mm -hmm. the, those are like in principle. Then you could run Shor's algorithm. Okay. At the end of the day. yeah. Okay. So so that's how I distinguish. But the thing which is sort of neat about that what D-Wave does is they have you know <laughs> two thousand qubits, which is you know really pretty many. Um, but again, you could, you know, but it's sort of a separate issue because you're not sure which problems, you know, whether there is a problem where they, you can solve it more efficiently. Anyway, so, um, so, so the different architectures are good for different things. And so I've been working mostly in silicon. Uh, and silicon, again, is a material that is uh, used uh, most widely in electronics today. So your phone right. is made out of, you know, the chips in your phone are made out of silicon. And, and the reason is um, uh, basically, we, I mean, I, I will say that the, what we're doing is works only at low temperature, and so you would not be able to carry it around in your pocket, but we're hoping to leverage all of the um, investment that's gone into scaling of silicon electronics right. and, and actually make a really big quantum computer. So this is sort of this idea of you're really going to have something, you know, big with a lot of cubes. Right. Okay. And so, um, so that's the motivation behind our work is to, you know, do something that's really truly scalable. Um, did you want me to talk a little bit about? Um, um, uh, wait, I was going to say. Oh, right. I could tell you a little bit about the se semiconductors, and I could. Uh, so I I yeah. just did. I'll tell you about so the different architectures. Each one is fascinating, and each one is. Um, uh, you know, of course, decade at this point, a couple of decades of work <laughs> that people have done. And again, one of the things which is really neat about the field is, um, you know, people have taken it. There, it's almost like art, where you know you have like a medium that you like to work in. So, so there's a guy um, two doors down in, in my, you know, so I'm in my office, and there's a guy two doors down, and he. He's an atomic physicist, and so he works on uh, what are called Rydberg atoms. So this is, again, you know, just to give you an idea of the kinds of things people do. And what Rydberg atoms are is that, um, like, so he uh, so uses um, rubidium typically, but rubidium's an element. But, but rubidium is an element with, like, one extra electron. So, so morally speaking, you could say, well, it's just like hydrogen. It's, it's not exactly like hydrogen, but everything I'm going to tell you is is as if it was hydrogen because that's the level at which I understand things. So the thing about hydrogen <laughs> is that you know you've, it has like a you know it has a proton and then it has this electron around there and and it likes to be pretty strongly bound and so the you know the size of a of a hydrogen atom is like half an angstrom it's really small. 
Okay, but what you can do is you can excite it up to a very, you know, to an excited state where the where the electrons bound, but just not very strongly. Okay, and and that's called a Rydberg atom. And so like the, you know, so so basically the ground state n is one, and then there's is it enter? It's either one or zero. I'm going to call it one. You know, and and then a Rydberg atom like n might be like 300. I mean, you know, really big. Okay. And uh, and when you have that, then then it's like super polarizable. You can think you've got this giant cloud, of this, you know, and, and and you know the ins and the nucleus is really tiny, and so the cloud is really big. And so so what happens is if you you know change the state of one of the atoms, all of a sudden it has this huge impact because it's so polarizable. And it turns out you can use that effect to make qubits. Okay, and he's trying to build a quantum computer out of Rydberg atoms, and he has um, he's able to make 49. He can put do 49 of them in a seven by seven array, and he has beautiful, beautiful single qubit gates. His two qubit gate is not great yet. That's that's like the harder thing to do. Oh, and by the way, if you have uh, so, so the single qubit gate is, you know, you take you take your thing and it has the two spins, and you you need to show you can make any superposition you want and with really high accuracy, okay, and he's done that, okay. Um, but then you also have to do it where if you take two qubits together, you say, oh, well, we have to make it where if we change the state of this one, it changes the state of that one, and everybody, and, and but again, really perfect, really high accuracy. Mm -hmm. Two, you know, right. having two qubits affect each other. And um, uh, and so, and, 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 and then what, again, what was not, known but is known now is that if you can do that single cubic eight plus two cubic eight you can do anything okay and again that's the way your phone works it's up to turns out in classical electronics you need to do three you need to be able to couple three things together okay um you it's not enough to do just two you have to do three okay um if it was well never mind it, that that's a source i could i could be pedantic about that but roughly speaking it's a little different because if it was reversible classical, you need three. Okay, your phone uses NAND gate; it's only two, but it's because it's not right. quantum at all. Okay. Anyway, so so once you have a two cubic gate and a one cubic gate, you know you're good to go, right? And then and then everything is just trying to get this thing to scale and to correct errors. And uh, uh -huh. so um, anyway, and so his two cubic gate has he doesn't know exactly but it's not as good as he wants but if he gets that then again he then has this way of like he he puts them in optical traps and he can you know try to scale that and it's a completely different architecture and it's it's actually really interesting to see what's the same and what's different um yeah uh okay so then i want to talk about two other kinds because these are well, actually three but we'll, we'll yeah. okay so one other kind is using um superconductors and this is the most advanced at the moment, I would say. This is the technology that the Google people are using and also the IBM people. Yeah. And um, uh, there's also a, a very, um, a very, you know, really excellent group at Yale that did some really pioneering work using this architecture. And there, um, uh, the, the, how, how can I explain how it works really easily? I think the way to say it is that um, they use the superconductivity. Um, the, the the thing uses uh, things called Joseph's injunctions, okay, which uses particular properties of superconductivity to make a nonlinear element. And whenever you're doing electronics, you need something that's a nonlinear element. And what do I mean by that? It's just that you know uh, a resistor is linear. That if you put on a voltage, the current is you know linear in the resistance. And to make any sort of interesting electronic um, device, you have to do something that's nonlinear, where the current is not proportional to the voltage. Okay, and uh, the these entities called Joseph's injunctions are nonlinear elements that they 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 use, and um, and they've been able to re engineer these things so they're just amazingly coherent, and and their quantum coherence mm. is is um, you know it's just stupendous. Um, and, so yeah. wait for just a second there, because you're talking about quantum coherence. Yeah. I mean, we should probably define that. I mean, oh. basically, what you're talking about there is is basically not accidentally measuring things. Is that right? Yes. So you're kind right. of keeping that's the easiest quantum. way to think about quantum. At least I like to think about it. Is that you know that basically you have your qubit and um, uh, uh, 
you know, and and you're trying to make it do what it wants to do, but if something accidentally messes it up, then you know you're it, it's it, it's it's bad. And, and again, and the qubit doesn't know whether you know you were meaning to make a measurement or not meaning to make a measurement. When when it gets disturbed, it, you can still like ruin the superposition. And so um, so what's happened in superconductors is that they they've they've been able to increase you know to decrease the effect of the environment by it's about a factor of a hundred thousand, which is a huge factor. And so, so a lot of what we've done actually in the last few years is we read, we read their papers very carefully and we, um, uh, you know, see if we can adapt some of the ideas that they've had in, into the semiconductors to improve our, you know, to improve what we're doing. Um, and so, um, but, but it's, it's been fabulous. I mean, in terms of the progress they've been able to make. And so, mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so that's a, you know, that's a, you know, so I, I wanted to be clear that, you know, that's, that's a really, really interesting technology and they've made, you know, tremendous progress. And when you read about it in the newspaper, that's, that, you know, that, that's a technology that you, you read about because it's made such great progress. Um, sure. Then um, I did want to mention one other thing, which is a, um, at some level it's extremely speculative, but at some other level it's extremely interesting, is that there's all, that, that, that Microsoft has, um, has an effort which over the last two years, I'd say, they've ramped up tremendously. They've had this effort for a really long time, but it was like this little boutique thing to do a thing called topological quantum computation. And um, what they want to do is to make, you know, a really exotic um, material, use a, a very exotic material system that, and, the, and that basically they've never made a qubit yet, okay? They still have zero qubits working. But if they get it to work, then it turns out that, the, 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 that this property, uh, th this material has, um, it has what's called topological properties. So, so it, the qubits are actually protected from decoherence. Okay, and so they, their their thing is they say, oh, nobody has really gotten error correction to really work. I mean, error correction again. Peter Shore again was you know really influential here, where he 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 showed how to do error correction quantum mechanic on a quantum computer, but it's very um, challenging. Okay, and nobody's really gotten. A reasonable, you know, error correction to work in a scalable fashion. I feel very confident saying that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that and the superconducting people haven't yet. And uh, and there's also I I forgot about to tell you about ion trap, but there's one other technology, but they haven't yeah. working yet. Okay. And um uh and so the idea of the topological one is it's like much much harder to get a qubit to work, but the t topological properties would make the error correction easier. Um, I see, and that, and so, um, uh, and, and and this is one where I follow it. Very, I, you know, I've been just following what they're doing. Uh, again, on the experimental side, they they haven't really demonstrated anything yet. But on the, on the other hand, you know, I've read about it enough to know that it's like not crazy to think that they will sometime soon. And if you yeah. they do, you heard it here that you know this was an interesting <laughs> thing to. Uh, to look at, but right. anyway, but I find it, it's a very interesting effort that they're doing. So, so there, you know, there's a lot of different approaches and a lot of different yeah. groups. And, um, and again, one of the things which is nice is that, um, even, you know, it's like, it's not like, oh, if these guys do it, then all my work is useless because we've learned like, an you know, I, I've been working on these silicon quantum dots. We've learned an incredible amount of stuff that you can do. And, you know, just the state of the art and what you can do, just, you know, controlling the magnetism and, you know, you know. So, so in all of these technologies, you know, even if you, in the end you don't end up with a billion qubits, you still have really pushed the envelope in terms of like what you can do in controlling these physical systems. And so, you know, I, it, it's been really exciting, I think, for me to be able to follow um, all you know as many different technologies as I can handle you know because you know partly because we steal I, with a attribution of course but we you know try to adapt <laughs> the ideas that people have been doing right. and, and you know and sort of express it in 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 the silicon media right and so in that sense it's it's really sort of like you know you you see something you like and then you're trying to you know sort of 
adapt it so that you can you can do the same thing in a different in a different physical system. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, we've, yeah. um, we've got about 10 minutes left, okay. so um, I would like you to just, if you could, since you mentioned quantum dots and that's the area that yeah. you're looking at, maybe we could sort of describe how those work and how they're different from sort of how a standard transistor would work. Oh, okay. So the thing about a quantum dot is it's actually really very close to a standard transistor. Okay. Um, uh, basically, a standard, I mean, there, there are different kinds of transistors, but the, but sure. the, the, the the one that I understand fully, the simplest one, is is a thing where basically you have you have metal, okay, you you have silicon, and you have a piece of metal on top, you, and there's a thin oxide layer, so so it's called MOS, okay, metal oxide semiconductor, okay, so you have a little oxide layer, so 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 you don't get any current leaking through, okay, and then you just put a big um, positive voltage, and then the the electrons, you know, sort of go to the surface, okay. And uh, and and that, these are the electrons I was talking about before, right? And that's on. And if you turn the voltage off, then the electrons go away, and then it's off, okay? And um, and so so what you're doing is you're just taking you're you're just you know you're just taking metal gates and you're putting voltages on them, and um, and and they move electrons around, okay? And 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 again, I've simplified it slightly, sure. but yeah, it's that's... basically how you know. Your computer works, and your phone works, and your TV works, and your car works at this point. Okay, so so what happens in a quantum dot is you're essentially doing the same thing, but you're just doing it with fewer electrons. Okay, and and also what you, we do is like typically it's only on and off, and so we actually have things where we uh, have a few, we have extra extra voltage gates to you know. Like we might have the neighboring thing, I, you know, to get the things to talk to each other. We'll we'll have them on neighboring things and then sort of lift one up and lower one down. And you know, we manipulate our things by changing relative voltages as well. But again, only on nearest neighbors. We don't go nuts. Um, and uh, uh, and and the dot is the, they're called quantum dot just because you know you have like a region and then you have a a, a little region with with an electron in it. Sometimes we have two electrons, but just the number of electrons is really small. But the technology is as close as you could get, and to to what we're using now, and that's what makes it sort of, you know, plausible that it's a scale. You know, that you could turn this into uh, technology that's scalable and also in you know able to be integrated with classical electronics in a reasonably straightforward way. So it's just that. It's like we've been doing it all along in the sense of we've been taking gates and you know making electrons by, put, by applying voltages to gates, but the, they're quantum dots just because they don't have very many electrons in them. So um, I see. Okay, so um, but that's sort well, of why. Actually, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, I was going to ask how you actually measure um, these. Uh, the quality is, is is something that you've mentioned in, in your talks oh, about how yeah. you measure qubit quality. Had what does that actually mean? I mean, what makes a, a, a high quality qubit? Oh, okay. So again, this the, the, there there's a there's a quantity which is called the fidelity. Okay, and the idea is when you are. Um, uh, you're doing you're doing a manipulation. So so again, like if if it was a classical computer, you'd say, oh, okay, I'm gonna take this thing and this thing, and I'm gonna do a, an AND gate, okay, and then you get an output, okay. Well, there there's an analogous thing with the bits where there's a thing which is called uh, the C naught. I'll pick C naught, okay, which is controlled naught. So if this guy is one. Uh, then, um, then it's a not gate, and if it's not one, it's it, it just it just gives what you had before. Okay, it it flips it only if the control is one. Okay, all right. So then it turns out is that you can write, you know, you can figure out like exactly what you want that to do, it, and it needs to work for every conceivable input state. And uh, and again, in order to be able to have a reliable computation and do error correction. You have to get it to work essentially, um, you know, to give you the right answer to within, roughly speaking, 0.1 percent. You know, mm -hmm. if you're optimistic, you might say 0.5, but again, this is the error correction problem. Okay, and so that's really the thing of like, there's something that you want to do, and you need to be able to do what you want to do to within 0.1 percent. Okay, and um, and again, that's quantified by this 
by something called the fidelity, which is basically you take your initial state, you take the desired final state, you see what you got, and you see how close they are. Okay, and 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 you average that over all possibilities, and that's 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 the fidelity. Okay, I but see. this 0.1% is you know that's that it's it's pretty challenging, and so um, you know so a lot of time is spent optimizing. And so, you know, so so the, so I talked to John Martinez, who is the Google, you know, head of the Google effort, you know, and basically, apparently, in the morning, the first guy in, you know, just sets these guys optimizing in order to be able to do that. Because basically, you say, oh, I do the gate, oh, I'm off by whatever, oh, okay, so I'll tweak it a little, and and then it goes through this whole process of tweaking. Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's it's challenging, but again, they've they've gotten it working for you know. Um, um, Again, he hasn't shown the 20, but he's gotten nine. So there, there's five online, there's nine that's been published, and, you know, and again, the, what we hear, you know, through, you know, people giving talks and stuff is the, the, they think they can do 20 where every pair is 99.9% .9 good and et cetera with right. you know, high fidelity. So that's we, the incredible um, have, progress. We have a question here, which I think okay. sort of leads up to a closing question. Okay. Should we start preparing ourselves for quantum computing platform wars, um, <laughs> which I guess has to do with the different kinds of quantum computing okay. possible. But I think that also ties back to, do we have sort of a timeline sense of when quantum computing yeah. might sort of hit a useful stage or a commercial stage? Or would it ever be commercialized? Would it ever be a replacement for standard transistors? Or okay. is it sort of limited? Yeah. Well, at the moment, it's limited for for a couple reasons. So, so it's limited right now because um, the, um, uh, the the superconductors have to also work at very low temperatures. So you're not going to carry around one in your pocket because the temperature where they work is very low. The ion trap people, though, are um, uh, they they you could imagine doing something portable with ion traps. The problem with so ion traps are ions in traps, okay, and and they've been miniaturized greatly over the last decade. Um, the issue with them is that they they have a scalability issue because it turns out like one trap can only hold about 15 ions, and then and then things and so you have to couple different traps together, and that coupling between different traps is very non-trivial. But if you had an application where 15 qubits would do it for you, you know, in some efficient way to make it worthwhile, I mean, they could make an ion trap to do that tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of this sort of like worrying about this, the guy at Citibank and his trillion dollars, there I think really the issue is error correction. Okay, nobody's really demonstrated a scalable error, path to error correction, and, the, and it's 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 surprisingly non-trivial. I mean, you say, oh look, I've got great gates and I can do whatever, but 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 you have to. The, 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 it's just harder than it sounds, okay? And I don't know when that's going to be solved, you know. But I guess having seen the progress between 2001, which is when I really started paying attention, to now, I, I'm pretty convinced it will be solved. <laughs> but I think we're looking at a 10 to 20 year time frame, okay? But the error correction problem has to be solved before. Um, um, uh, before you can say, oh, okay, now I know that we have um, uh, uh, commercial applications. Um, right. Because otherwise what happens is that even if you have like 99.9%, .9%, every time you make a new step, you have a little bit of error. Okay, so after right. you go a thousand steps, then you, you have no idea what you have. And so that means you can only do calculations of, of what are called bounded depth. And, that, you know, and that's very limiting. Okay, that you know, for any size problem, you can only do a certain number of steps until you lose your accuracy. So, so error correction is right. really, really important. Okay, and so that's right. what I don't know. So that's and so I, I, you know, and that's challenging enough that I don't think it's going to be ten years. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we're basically out of time, but I did want to ask you a couple of questions just before sure. we go there, kind of a little bit more general, that we always ask our distinguished lecturers to talk about just briefly, uh, because it's Sigma Xi, we get a lot of student yeah. members and things like that. So yeah. um, just a couple of quick ones. Um, I wondered if you could talk about, um, in this kind of research, you're talking about so many different 
ways of approaching it. Do you find that having diversity of researchers with different backgrounds and different cultures on your team is important for coming up with creative solutions to problems? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, and that's the thing about the field altogether um, um, is the yeah you know, there's the computer science end there's the physics end and again I started as a physicist but you know just I mean I try to read but it's not the same as having people have you know working with computer scientists and sort of bridging that divide you know that it, it's really really valuable um, and then also. Again, in the silicon, we're we're still working on the two cubic gates, so we haven't done so much on the scale up. But on the scale up side, I I you know I talk to people, and there you know there's tremendous knowledge that the engineer you know that engineers have that mm -hmm. you know it's just it's it's just a whole other level of 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 thinking about how to put things together so that they all work according to plan, and so um so as the scale up becomes more and more important, that will also be another field that you know, really mm -hmm. has to be incorporated in a really fundamental way. Um, uh -huh. So, so the diversity of the backgrounds is, uh, of, of the disciplines is really, is really critical. Mm -hmm. But even when you're, I mean, multi multidisciplinary uh, collaborations obviously right. are, are important here. But but what about actual like researchers who come from different co countries or oh. different parts of the country and things like that as well? Does that help in terms of different approaches to problems? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, so both, both I haven't thought about people. it that way so much. I mean, certainly our group. We've had people from all over the world, uh, you know, from Korea and Brazil and Australia, and, you know, and, 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 you know, it just everybody contributes in, in different ways. And it's a really international community. Um, and so, um, but to be honest, I don't know that I would say, oh, the Australians have a particular thing that they do, or, you know what I mean? It's just that the, 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 the um, the international community is 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 really really great. Oh, and also I forgot. There's a you know huge effort in China also, uh -huh. and um, right. uh, you know really you know and really good work and, and you know and it just like without you can't help but be influenced by all people from sure. all over the world. But but I don't know that I would say that there's a particular like this country is good at X. It's just a it's oh, no. just a really international research effort. Uh huh. And I'm sure you're working with a lot of students in your group. You've got people going towards their PhDs. Uh, yeah. We tend to get a lot of student members here at Sigma Xi. So I wondered if you could mention um, if you have a general sort of pithy piece of advice you give to people for surviving the PhD process. Uh, oh, because it can yeah. often be challenging to just get through it. Yeah. I mean, I'd say that, um, well, there are a couple things to say. And but I'll give the advice I always give people, which hopefully um, will not annoy you too much. And <laughs> that is the most important thing is to be interested in what you're doing. You know, to wake up in the morning and you know want to know what happens. Okay. And I I think it's really easy to um, sort of you know because there's this thing of saying oh I have to prepare for the future. You know oh I have to do this so I can get a job later, but um, but 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 it's still really important to like like what you're doing in the moment because mm -hmm. you end up doing it for a long enough time that um, uh, if you don't like it, it just it just really is is bad. So so I'd say that's the thing of just you know just being aware that it's not just delayed gratification, but you know may, you know just just liking what you're doing and, and thinking that what you're doing is is interesting to you and you don't even have to it doesn't have to be interesting to anybody else really okay but, but it has to be interesting to you because you're the one who has to wake up and do it and um, and I certainly had that when I was in, in in graduate school through some very long story I I, I was working on a project where I wasn't very interested like and, and you know and I tried to you know and I thought it would be good for me and all this stuff but 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 one day I just woke up and realized that like you know I, I couldn't do it I'm not gonna say whether it was right or wrong I just wasn't able to do it it was just like I wasn't interested I couldn't do it I had to change something and so right. um, that to me was the most important thing and then it works out because you just bumble into things and you know there you go. <laughs> right so I hope that helps. Great. Thank you. So we're a few minutes over, so I'm